Hey, everyone. Um, we are just getting started. We're going to give everyone a moment to join us. Um, but while we're waiting for people to click through, um, love for folks to drop in the chat their name, pronouns, organizations, shout out hello. Um, it's lovely for us to see who is joining us and from where. Um, if you want to throw in something you're hoping to learn today, love to see that as well. So everyone join us in the chat as we are getting started and waiting for everyone to find that link in their email and jump on. We have a packed call today and we are really, really, um, I wanna make sure we get to everyone. So we'll get started pretty soon, but I do wanna give people a chance to just find the link and get logged on. Thank you so much for joining us for today's Movement Tools training. Um, loving to, love seeing everyone say hello in the chat. So if you have um, the chance, drop us in a note in the chat, say where you're from, what organization you're from, Love to hear where you want to learn. Um, and I will also say, as we're waiting for our folks to jump on, we would love for you to, as, as we are going through, um, drop questions in the Q&A box. If you look down at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A box. Um, it's a lot easier for us to tr track them if you drop your questions in the Q&A box than if you drop them in the chat. So highly encourage questions to go in the Q&A box. Um, our team will try to keep a track of everything. Lovely to see everyone from all over. Thank you for joining. I am gonna kick us off because we have so much to get going and I know folks are gonna keep, keep joining as we go. Um, hopefully you all won't miss too much as people are jumping on. Um, so welcome to the Movement Tools 2022, a series of trainings from Progressive Caucus Action Fund and our friends at Six Action. Um, they're happening every three weeks on Thursdays for the next few months. Actually, our last one is in July. So we're really <laughs> going through it throughout the year. We're really delighted that these first three sessions focus on implementation are co-hosted by Six Action. Um, I'm Jessica Juarez Scruggs, the Director of Training and Capacity Building at the Progressive Caucus Action Fund. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm calling in from the unceded lands of the Duwamish people in Seattle, Washington. Um, lovely to see everyone from all over the place. Really love seeing everyone say hello in the comments. I want to start off with a couple of quick reminders. Um, the first one is that although PCAF and Six Action are 501c4 organizations, we know that many of you are representing 501c3 organizations or you're here in your official capacity. So we're going to dig deep into a media policy discussion today, but we're not going to be talking about electoral or partisan conversations during this session. The other piece of housekeeping is we've enabled automatic closed captioning. If you go to the bottom of your screen and click on live transcript, you'll be able to enable, enable, enable the closed captioning for yourself. Um, we know that it because it's AI, it's often a little buggy. So we do go back through after and fix up the transcript and, and send out a video um, with all of the materials after. So if you want to receive that and make sure you get a better transcript, um, a better closed captioning experience, um, make sure that you have registered. And, and my colleague Heejin is going to drop the link um, in the chat for everyone. If you, when you joined in, it said event participant, that means we don't have your email necessarily. So make sure you've registered. Um, go to that link and register so you can get the materials that we'll send out after the fact. Um, the goal of this training series is to dive into the policies and systems that shape our communities identify the opportunities and the organizing strategies our movement can use to fight for a country where all of our families can thrive. So we've spent a couple of weeks talking about implementation, and now this is the session where we're really digging into the opportunities and challenges in this moment. What is the, the money your communities can answer? What are the processes that are in place right now? Um, how do we really wrestle with this moment and make sure that um, we deliver for, for our communities and our families? Um, so I'm so excited to um, hand the mic over to our moderator for today and my co-conspirator on this theory on this series, Nahal Zamani. Um, Nahal is the Senior Vice President of State Strategies and Services at Six and Six Action. And before joining Six Action, Nahal was the Director of Movement Building at Demos, a progressive think tank. Um, Nahal previously served at the Center for Constitutional Rights and led human rights and advocacy work and campaigns at the ACLU. And it has been such a pleasure to work with her on this series. I could not hand it over <laughs> to a better person. So take it away, Naha. Thank you. And thank you everyone for tuning in. We are so delighted to be in space with you to strategize and reflect on the opportunities before us. 
Now, as we all know, between the pandemic and the economic crisis, there are a number of federal initiatives and supports, including targeted investments to help us all recover from the health and economic impacts of this crisis. And um, these resources have really been crucial in coming to our states and our localities where we're based and allowing us to sustain our communities. So today we're going to be gathering to talk about what's on the table. We've brought together an amazing panel of experts to talk about the crucial opportunities that we can both seize and mobilize around. I am so delighted to be starting today's discussion with a special guest from the Biden administration and someone I'm so um, proud to call a former colleague, Chirag Baines, um, who is the deputy assistant to the president and the deputy director of the Domestic Policy Council for Racial Justice and Equity. Um, Chirag supervises DPC's democracy and voting rights, criminal justice, disability, native affairs, racial wealth gap, and broad equity portfolios. His work includes the implementation of President Biden's executive order on advancing racial equity and support for underserved communities, as well as an executive order on diversity, equity, inclusion throughout the federal government and accessibility in the federal workforce across every agency and department. Tarag previously served as a special assistant to the president for criminal justice and guns policy at the DPC, and also previously as the director of legal services, legal strategies at the nonprofit organization, Demos. He earned his JD from Harvard Law School and his BA from Yale. I am again, so delighted to welcome you here today to start us off and welcome to the Movement Tools series. Um, so Chirag, the Biden administration has really made this commitment to centering equity and justice, both within the federal government as a workforce and within the administration's policy priorities. Can you share with us the work that you're doing right now to ensure that racial equity is built into the work of federal agencies and these policy priorities? Absolutely, Nahal, it's great to be here with you. Thank you for having me. Thank you everyone for this opportunity to talk about our work and, and to be in conversation with you. Uh, I, I do have the privilege of leading the racial justice and equity work stream and, and it is a priority for the administration uh, and for the president. Uh, actually in his first day in office, uh, within hours of taking office, the president signed this historic executive order directing the whole of government that is the entire government, all of the agencies, all the White House components to advance an ambitious equity agenda uh, that matches the scale of the challenges that we're facing and, and also the opportunities that we have in front of us. Uh, so I'm gonna get into it a little bit, but before I jump into the details of the EO, I wanna thank all of you, uh, those on the screen, those who are tuning in, uh, folks in the movement for justice and equity, uh, your, your leadership, your advocacy, uh, pushed the federal government to finally advance a long overdue equity agenda. We know uh, we were miles away from this uh, just before the president took office. And this has never happened before. This kind of commitment, the stated commitment and the way in which we are working across all of government to look at all of our policies and all of our programs to see how they can be more equitable, how they can advance racial justice is a testament to the strength of the field and the expertise that all of you have we're building on the foundation that you've been laying for many years. So I want to thank you for that. Uh, the EO, that day one executive order, recognized that for too long, the federal government itself had failed to provide equal access to opportunity for underserved communities. And that's a pretty broad set of communities. You're absolutely talking about black and brown individuals, communities of color. We're also talking about rural communities, tribal nations, LG LGBTQI individuals, people with disabilities, and communities that are facing and have been facing persistent poverty. That is millions and millions of people across the country. And there are obviously people who fall into multiple of those categories. And we see the compounding of disadvantage and barriers to uh, government programs. Uh, and so it's this, there's a lot of work to be done, uh, and, and including to address the federal government's own role uh, in locking people out of opportunity. So that is part of our task as we build a more prosperous nation for everyone. The executive order charged federal agencies with taking stock uh, and conducting an assessment of how each of their 
major policies and programs allow inequity to fester. So what, they, what has happened in the past that needs to be overcome, but also what is happening right now? What barriers, intentional or not, uh, that are in there uh, you know, to government policies and programs do we have to address? Wh what are, which ones are perpetuating the historic exclusion of underserved communities from full participation in this uh, American economic and civic life? Based on that assessment, this was actually a process that agencies had to do. They had to, you know, they, they have equity teams. They looked at their practices and policies. They had meetings about this. They invited, you know, um, expertise from the outside as well. They were directed to assess their practices and policies, and then to produce first of their kind equity action plans. These are galvanizing documents that lay out three to five specific new strategies on how each agency would put equity and racial justice at the heart of their mission. So there's this over, overarching commitment to equity in administration, but there are also the mechanics of how you build equity into government policy making. And it was this process of assessment and then identifying policy commitments and making those commitments public so that the White House can track them and the you know, American people can also track them and hold folks accountable. Um, it's those action plans, I should say, are not the whole of these agencies' equity strategies. So I really encourage you to, to get a hold of these and, and look at them and read them. But if you don't see something in there, it doesn't mean we're not prioritizing equity in that particular work stream. It's just that there's this process of identifying a few concrete commitments that you're putting in these plans. And then you're also accountable more generally as an agency for this commitment. So. Uh, that's the equity action plans. I, uh, perhaps I'll get a chance to say a little bit more about them, but I also want to mention this sort of more internal facing work that Nahal, you referenced. The, we call it the DEIA executive order, the Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Accessibility Executive Order. You don't always hear the A. The A is really important. Accessibility, paying attention to individuals with disabilities, and making sure government is not just not discriminating against individuals with disabilities, but is you know, implementing principles of universal design and really truly making processes and um, uh, resources and programs accessible to all people. So uh, that executive order recognized that we need a federal workforce and public servants at the highest levels who truly look like America. Uh, even with decades of progress, and there has been progress, building a federal workforce that looks like America, we have enduring legacies of employment discrimination, systemic racism, and gender inequality, and those are still felt today. Too many underserved communities remain underrepresented in our federal workforce, especially in periods, uh, in positions rather, of leadership. Uh, that's why the president signed this executive order, this DEIA executive order. The EO charges every agency with affirmatively advancing DEIA in their employment practices, in their hiring practices. And it directs the federal government to become a model employer for communities that have been underrepresented in these positions. Again, that's the, the, the groups that I, I refer to, uh, but there are some other groups that are historically underrepresented in federal service. So, so we're talking about people of color, women, LGBTQI individuals, uh, first, generational, first generation professionals and college graduates, immigrants, people with limited English proficiency, and formerly incarcerated individuals. We named all of these uh, groups in the executive order, and each agency has to pay attention to them. Uh, you know, there are some specifics in this DEIA executive order as well that are worth looking at. The government, for example, is reducing its reliance on unpaid internships. That's an equity issue. Uh, advancing pay equity to close racial and gender wage gaps, uh, preventing and addressing sexual harassment in the workplace, expanding access to diversity and implicit bias trainings, which the previous administration, you may recall, tried to ban. Uh, the executive order requires agencies to build pipelines into public service from HBCUs and other minority serving institutions. And as I mentioned at the top, it makes the federal government uh, a leader on accessibility by addressing the physical, the technological, and you know, I have to say also the attitudinal barriers that people with disabilities continue to face in the workplace across the country. So these are just two of the processes we're leading, Nahal, but I'm glad to start with them because they are really whole of government processes. And we look forward to partnering with all of you on this. We cannot do this work alone. We need to be partners with you and we need your expertise. Thank you. I'd love to probe a little bit more on um, Executive Order 13985. 
Um, so given that the, the government has released these equity plans, what are the biggest shifts on the horizon you're seeing in the implementation of that executive order, um, which just to recall for everybody's attention is around support and advancing equity for underserved communities? Yeah, that's right. Uh, EL 13985, it doesn't exactly roll off the tongue, but it's, it is it is this equity EO. So I'm going to shorthand it that way for folks. Uh, you know, these equity action plans are, are a big deal. I began to talk about it in response to your previous question, but it's over 90 federal agencies that released equity action plans. Actually, 50 of them weren't even required to. They're independent agencies that decided they want to get on the train. They want to be part of this because they understand the importance of centering equity and making sure their work is accessible and is actually advancing um, you know, equal opportunity and equitable outcomes for all Americans. So 90 plus agencies, 300 plus specific actions that are in these plans. Um, and I should say, you can see this all. If you go to whitehouse.gov slash equity, there's uh, some narrative information there kind of knitting together these plans. There are summaries that are, that are meant to be more accessible, you know, that are shorter, uh, easier to get a handle on what's in the uh, each of these reports for the largest agencies on that website. If you go to performance.gov, you can get access to all of the agency action plans in full as well. So uh, I do encourage folks to read them. Uh, they contain these specific commitments to address systemic barriers in policies and programs that hold people back from uh, prosperity, equality, and dignity. That is, that is itself the first kind of big shift, the fact that we did this and that we are now holding ourselves accountable to it. Uh, together, they will advance a number of priorities. You know, they contain uh, specific policies and commitments on economic justice, on health equity, on educational opportunity, on criminal justice reform, uh, on civil rights more generally. Uh, actually, every agency addressed civil rights enforcement as well as um, procurement. So those are two consistent factors you'll see across the plans. They're looking at what is our capacity to enforce and ensure compliance with civil rights laws. And in many cases, identifying that they need more resources for that work or they need to make some shifts in the work. Uh, and then procurement, the federal government spends $600 billion a year, you know, huge uh, amount of expenditures. And uh, the president announced in commemoration of the Tulsa race massacre last year, that he had set a goal of increasing the amount of uh, federal spending that goes towards small disadvantaged businesses, including those that are owned by people of color. Uh, and it's gonna be actually $100 billion in additional spending over the next five years. So you can see how each agency is helping to make that happen in their equity action plans. Uh, and then I, I do wanna give you a flavor of the, some of the things that you will see in there that are unique to each uh, agency, You know, specific things that they're doing. Um, the Department of Labor, as an example, is gonna be advancing equity for workers who have faced longstanding barriers to employment, workers of color, um, and in, in particular, Barriers in accessing unemployment insurance. So the Labor Department has announced these new grants that are called equity grants that are providing funding to state unemployment insurance systems to help them remove outdated requirements, you know, like requirements that people have to go through multiple rounds of identity verification to confirm that they're eligible for, for um, um, unemployment insurance or um, requirements that people, you know, commit complete forms uh, in paper and not be able to apply online, which is also a barrier. Um, all of these make it harder for individuals, especially low income workers to navigate accessing their benefits. Uh, and that's not where we need to be. So, so another example is EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency is shifting the way it does civil rights enforcement. It is no longer going to do just, you know, uh, com responding to complaints that come in. It's actually shifting its model to be more affirmative and to go out and identify where there are likely to be civil rights problems and to initiate investigations on its own. The Department of Defense is looking at uh, artificial intelligence development. You know, they are the largest funder of AI development in the government, and they have identified advancing equitable AI development, that is doing it in a way that mitigates the risk of uh, algorithmic bias, uh, which is an issue in a whole host of different AI technologies. Uh, that's the Department of Defense saying we're making that commitment. You now can help hold them accountable for that, offer your expertise as they work through that. Um, that's a pretty significant step. Um, and you know, just one more example I'll give is that 
the Department of Health and Human Services is expanding postpartum Medicaid coverage to reduce maternal mortality. That is uh, a, a major issue. They're extending coverage. We know that maternal mortality is disproportionately an issue for Black women and for Native women. Uh, this is meant to address that. So you can see how these are often very concrete commitments that are made across the government and that affect uh, a whole host of constituencies. Uh, there are also some uh, wonkier, potentially more boring uh, shifts that are in these plans, but I actually think it's part of how to make government more equitable. Uh, this would be things like reducing the complexity of government forms, you know, to apply for grant funding, for example, or for benefits. Um, I, I mentioned the one about procurement, you know, paying attention to where we're using our federal spend um, and expanding the use, uh, the collection and the use of demographic data. You know, we can't identify the right solutions if we don't understand with some granularity the problems, right? How policies are inequitable because we, because we don't have the data that breaks down into subgroups and helps us look at the intersection of different form, of different identity groups to identify where we need to pay more attention so that everyone truly has that opportunity. So um, I think that, you know, the shifts are, this is just a level of specificity and a level of sort of comprehensive nature of the approach that we haven't seen or done before in government. We have not attempted it. It is happening now. Uh, and the phase we're in is we, we have to implement all of these commitments. Uh, and on top of that, there's, we need to create a culture of continuing to identify barriers and then solutions to overcome those barriers um, that underserve community space. Thank you. And as our panel will start to speak to, there are so there's so much, so much federal funding right now on the table for state, local, and tribal governments. Um, Chirag, what are the implementation opportunities that are anticipated or ongoing rulemaking opportunities that you're tracking most closely right now? There are, there are a lot of them, Nahal. It's, a, it's, a, it's an excellent question. I mean, as you note, know, there, are, there are a lot of opportunities, in particular, a lot of resources, actually unprecedented resources that are available right now to advance equity uh, due to the leadership of President Biden and the partnership of folks who have supported legislative packages to include the American Rescue Plan and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill. And these are just historic bills that are going to help transform the country. At ARP, the American Rescue Plan, has been doing that already uh, you know, for the past year. Uh, so let me let me take uh, the example of the bipartisan infrastructure law. You know, one of the things we need to keep in mind is that we know how high the stakes are for communities across the country as we implement the funding. So many families across the country are still reeling from the consequences of inequitable infrastructure projects of the past. So what does that mean, inequitable uh, infrastructure projects? You know, think about the erosion of intergenerational wealth for families of color whose homes were taken by eminent domain um, to make way for the federal highway system. You know, the Secretary of Transportation has talked about that uh, quite forthrightly. Uh, think about the burdens of asthma and pollution on low-income communities and black and brown neighborhoods in particular who had Superfund sites built in their backyards. Uh, thinking about the economic isolation that rural communities and tribal communities face because of infrastructure disinvestment, you know, the funds were not going there. Uh, the physical isolation that people face uh, when infrastructure isn't accessible to so people with disabilities face that. And then the long-standing exclusion of women and LGBTQI plus individuals from apprenticeships and from jobs in the building trades. These are occupations that have higher wages, better benefits, and the protection of a union, all priorities for this administration. Um, and the building trades are working to diversify. We've got to pay attention to this because these infrastructure dollars are going to create innumerable jobs, right? So many additional jobs. We have to make sure that there's equitable access to those jobs as well. Um, that, I mean, overall, the bipartisan infrastructure law is a historic opportunity to right some of these wrongs from our past. And you know, if we if we live up to our potential and the potential of that bill, we can narrow wealth gaps, we can create good jobs for communities that are facing persistently high unemployment. We can address discrimination and structural barriers that have held women and people of color back. We can build rural prosperity, build tribal prosperity, 
uh, and just and more generally build a more resilient nation for the future. You know, we know that when you have a foundation of security, you can weather the kind of economic ups and downs better. You can weather the environmental challenges better. Um, and so what are, what are we doing to try to accomplish this? There are a number of things that the White House team is uh, putting in place to ensure equitable uh, inf implementation of infrastructure. It's happening, it's happening across grant programs now, and we'll look for additional ways to do so. You know, we're focusing on creating job opportunities that are available to everyone. We're working with grantees that get federal infrastructure funding to develop local planning processes that ensure that underserved communities have input into what the funding should be used for. That's about you know, who has influence over this historic opportunity. We are working to reduce barriers for uh, minority and women-owned businesses, those small disadvantaged businesses that I referred to. Uh, this is just, a, the, the infrastructure funding is a way to kind of uh, even level up beyond what the president has, is getting the federal agencies to do. So there's what the federal government spends its funding on, its procurement dollars. It's also, what about these local and state governments that are gonna be getting this money through the infrastructure bill. They should similarly be thinking about making sure that small businesses and small disadvantaged businesses uh, get some of the funds and get some of the contracts for all the construction projects that are gonna take place. So, uh, and then one more I'd, I'd mention is civil rights authorities. Agencies are getting more creative about how to use their civil rights authority. I'll mention one in particular, the Department of Transportation is thinking about how to do Title VI reviews on the front end as opposed to on the back end. So Title VI is a non-discrimination strat statute, part of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. It says you can't discriminate on the basis of race and color in uh, the use of federal funds. And often we're doing that kind of review at the end. After a grantee, a local government, for example, has spent funds, did they do it in an inequitable way, in a way that was not just inequitable, but in violation of civil rights law? DOT is saying, and other agencies can also pursue this strategy, what can we do up front to assess the likely impact of a particular project plan and whether it will have a disparate impact on people of color um, and, you know, based on the project design? That gives people the opportunity to shift project design and deal with it on the front end and avoid inequitable outcomes. So, um, so that, that, there you go, Nahal. Those are a few kind of wonky strategies that we're pursuing, but I, I hope it speaks to the, the nature of the commitment that the president has that we have here at the Domestic Policy Council and across the government to use this historic opportunity to advance equity. It is a truly ambitious agenda. Uh, it's an exciting one. I love coming to work every day, uh, but, uh, but it's challenging and we're gonna need your expertise and partnership. I just wanna reiterate that. Um, you know, through this conversation, but but also beyond. Thank you so much. We have a few more minutes for questions, and we have several that have come in from our audiences via email. Um, I wanted to know that we have a lot of movement partners on the call um, today. And the ex example that you gave earlier around the EPA and its affirmative stance is really compelling. Um, I know as someone that engaged in advocacy that the um, the Department of Justice and their ability to intervene uh, to investigate municipal police departments was something that you have been devoted to. And I myself as a crucial stopgap when local measures for accountability failed. So I'd love to hear any case studies or examples of other opportunities that movement partners and civil society can um, help the government realize this affirmative stance and be aware of these affirmative stance. Yeah, I mean, there's so many that when it comes to enforcement decisions, that is something, you know, many agencies have uh, enforcement authorities and they need information from on the ground about uh, you know, civil rights violations or alleged civil rights violations. You reference the pattern of practice investigations, Nahal, of police departments. Those depend uh, in, you know, they, on publicly available information as well as complaints that come in from the public. So. Uh, the work that meant, there is a lot of work that organizations here can do when it comes to fair housing, fair lending, you know, uh, again, Title VI compliance. So how are federal funds being used across all of these several agencies that are getting funding through uh, the government, uh, through the bipartisan infrastructure bill. So I would say contact agencies, let their offices of civil rights know. It's often helpful if you can package together information. 
Um, that's when it comes to civil rights compliance. And, and that's not actually my job, so I will not be involved in that. But each agency conducts its own in, uh, independent investigations. Uh, and it is a priority to make sure that they're well resourced and, and able to do that work. I think the other thing is I just want to hit again the agency equity action plans is a great opportunity to influence uh, how agencies focus their resources. The, the commitments are at differing levels of generality. Some of them are quite specific about a particular policy that's going to be uh, pursued. And even there, the agency may need assistance, right? We need, to, we need to know how is this playing out on the ground? What is the experience? You know, take the maternal uh, mortality example there. Uh, we need to, that is one where the policy was developed after uh, you know, quite a lot of, kind of evidence gathering and engagement with communities about what solution would be appropriate and it was creating this you know new opportunity to enroll in coverage so uh, extending the opportunity to enroll in coverage so i think looking at that seeing if there are specific uh, commitments where you have expertise and reaching out to the agencies uh, to share it would be helpful some of these commitments are at larger kind of higher levels of generality and they're just sort of a little bit more directional in a certain subject area um, and there's more work to be done to identify what the policy solution would be. That's an even more collaborative point to engage because you can offer your solutions. And again, I would urge folks to check out whitehouse.gov slash equity and performance.gov to take a look at those plans. Um, and I, I think you'll find a lot there if that's of interest. Great, I'm gonna attempt to squeeze in about three or four more questions, uh, but I will do my best. Um, first, I wanted to share a question that came in through our email. Um, how is the Biden administration addressing healing from the past trauma imposed by the federal government for communities of color and tribal communities as part of these executive orders? Great question, great question. I mean, there are a couple of ways. One is you know, taking the example of tribal communities and tribal nations in particular is, is a fundamentally different approach to how we engage. This administration is engaging in a nation to nation uh, um, sort of approach to consultation, policy development and communication, and also living up to our obligations in terms of providing resources and support for tribal communities. There, we know that for generations, we have not lived up to those obligations. And we have not, uh, for, for quite a long time, we have not engaged in a nation to nation way. The president made this a priority from the very beginning. And what you've seen over the past 15 months is extensive consultation. Every agency is required to consult. OMB, the Office of Management and Budget, is, is consulting with tribes on uh, policy decisions that have an impact on them on the front end in a way that we have never done before. It's setting kind of a new bar. Uh, you know, we had a tribal nation sub a summit uh, in uh, de December in which we unveiled you know, a slew of new policy announcements and had we were in deep conversation with cabinet secretaries and uh, the leaders of multiple tribes all uh, 574 federally recognized tribes were uh, invited in attendance it was a great way to kick off you know first year of the administration that's the culmination of the first year of the administration how we are going to approach things the other, the other piece of it is just historic funding that we've sought for tribes. You know, the ARP contains $32 billion in funding for tribes, including $20 billion that is direct funding to tribes for them to spend on the needs that they um, have, because they obviously know their needs better than anybody else. That is also true of the infrastructure bill. There's $13 billion that is dedicated for tribal needs, and then tribes are eligible for lots of other pots. So I think part of this is like, you know, very concrete. How are we engaging with folks? How, how do we treat them um, in light of the history of trauma and mistreatment from the government in the past? And what resources are we bringing to bear to help transform communities? Um, that is more broadly applicable as well. So um, I would point to that, and then I would just reiterate with the on funding with the, with the bipartisan infrastructure bill. Um, and also ARP, there's a second tranche of funding of state and local funding that is about to come out in about two weeks to state and local governments. Um, these are funds that are meant to address the needs of communities across the country. Um, and then I suppose the last thing I'll mention is that a lot of what the questioner might be referring to uh, is also the mental health impacts of uh, just, you know, decades of both disinvestment, um, but also kind of recurring uh, incidents in people's lives. And we need to pay more attention to mental health. We know this 
as a result of the pandemic that we're all living through. And the president has proposed historic resources that he's seeking from Congress in the FY23 budget, so the, the new budgeting cycle. Uh, and we're really hoping to get that because we want to increase the amount of resources that are going to local communities for mental health issues. Wonderful. I will use the mic and my opportunity as a moderator to ask you one last question, um, which came in from our Q&A function, really noting as you as you talked a lot of the money that's flowing to state and local governments, both from the infrastructure bill and the ARP. Um, the question is, how is the federal government going to hold state and local governments accountable to President Biden's justice and equity commitments? That's a, that's a great question and one that's on our minds. And again, one where we need some partnership. We have very varying levers where funding is competitive. That is that state and local governments have to apply for the funding. We have a lot more control. So we can make sure that these are equitable projects on the front end. We can uh, shape application processes in a way that they are more accessible, including to community-based organizations, not just local governments. Uh, and you know, we can also think about uh, and provide direct technical assistance. So uh, that is helping people to apply for these funds, know how to put together an effective application and then deploy the funds as well. Where it's a formula grant, that is the money that just goes based on a formula that Congress set in the statute to state and local governments, there is less control. There are still some, there are still some levers and Title VI, the non-discrimination requirements will apply to all of this funding because it's federal funding. So that's one we're really leaning into. It's why I mentioned this innovation where we're trying to figure out how do you do the front end analysis, not just wait to the back end. Um, but it's a lot of funding and it's going all over the country because we've got a lot of rebuilding to do and, uh, and correction to do. So uh, here's where I think if you are seeing things on the ground that we might not be seeing because we're not everywhere, um, issuing complaints to civil rights offices, reaching out to tell agencies, whether through their regional offices or here at headquarters offices in DC, uh, you know, what you're seeing and what you're experiencing is going to be critical. And, and the, how this part wasn't exactly your question, but I, but I just want to say that we need to hear from folks generally about how we're doing and engaging with government is critical. That's why I'm so pleased to be here today. A lot of folks have been turned off, you know, based on the nature of politics, based on the division, um, that we've seen over the years, uh, or sometimes because the government didn't deliver for them or their communities. They feel like, well, what is the point of engaging? Um, but we do hear from folks and we do re react and respond and engage and, and people can shape policy. So don't sit it out, I guess is what I would say. And, and please tell those that you work with that it, it doesn't help to sit it out. We really truly need to hear from those who are closest to the problems we're trying to solve in the country. Uh, and that's why uh, my invitation to hear from you uh, is, is truly sincere. Thank you. Tarag, anything else that you wanted to add after that? We'd love to open up and bring in the rest of our panel to talk about these very opportunities before us. I just want to say thank you. This is a great conversation. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about our equity work. It is a sustained commitment, so it's not going anywhere and it's just going to get deeper and deeper as the administration goes on. And I look forward to additional conversations in the hall with you and with others. Thank you. And we appreciate so much for you joining us um, this, this afternoon. And um, we also are appreciative of you fitting in to talk about these really crucial issues across the, the whole federal government. Um, and I'm gonna be bringing in the rest of our panel to continue the conversation and talk about the opportunities before us. Um, and we also thank Chirag, um, who will be slowly stepping off for another commitment. Um, I want to bring in the rest of our panel and really flag for everyone before we dive in that the team at PCAF has created a very helpful set of documents that outline the programs where funding for key priorities, such as broadband, clean water, toxic cleanup, child care, family and education will be made available. Each of these documents outlines the name of the program, where it is in the policy process, what level of government is implicated and can access that program and where it is overall. Um, these documents and as well as a wealth of other resources will be in your toolbox folder, which we'll send out after the session. So please be sure to sign up on the registration 
resource page so that you can access this resource. Um, I am so pleased to introduce Wendelay Marte, who is the Director of Economic Justice for Community Change and Community Change Action, where she leads on building power and advancing economic, racial, and gender justice in low-income communities and includes childcare and income support. She works to strengthen, connect, and mobilize grassroots efforts to enhance the leadership, voice, and power of Black, Brown, and immigrant organizations and movement leaders. Wendelay, Community Change and your partners have been really engaging deeply around implementation fights around the country. As organizers, why was that so important? And what is at stake for our communities? Yeah, uh, thank you for having me today for this very important conversation. Um, I would say that, uh, and this is uh, not news for anybody here, I don't think, but you know, we already had a crisis before the pandemic. Uh, we had many crises before the pandemic that were only aggravated and made more urgent, I think, as a result of, of all the things that happened since. And um, we, I think there was a, a moment in time when a lot of our focus as organizers, as a movement, was at the federal level because we understood that to really address the scope of the crisis, we needed, we needed sort of big investments from the federal government. And I would always sort of say that that's the first part of the fight. The first part of the fight when you're trying to make a public case for things that need to change in public policy the first fight is about getting those big investments that then will allow for the second phase of the fight, which is how do you actually spend that money in ways that are actually equitable across the board, that are address racial, gender, and economic disparities, and are really about uh, advancing both sort of like long-term affirmative um, like goals for, for how we want our communities to, to thrive but also like the immediate sort of threats and needs that specific communities face. And we know that low-income communities of color are the hardest hit <laughs> uh, every time that we have uh, an issue, a challenge um, in our society, in our country. And so I think the, the sort of basic answer first and foremost is implementation fights are really important because they actually allow us to define priorities. And they allow us to set models and examples at the local and state level that can really sort of direct what is possible, kind of like reimagine what's actually possible and set precedents for the kinds of fights that other states and other localities and other places across the country can really undertake. Um, and so I think that's sort of like the, the first sort of foundational uh, piece of this, which is this is about really uh, taking on fights that will allow us to set a precedent for what is possible in terms of addressing these bigger systemic inequities um, across the board. Uh, I would say that as organizers, you know, part of the fight is also about having the people that live the experiences every day that actually know what it's like to have to make hard choices for their families between childcare and putting food on the table and paying rent. Uh, and, you know, uh, we've seen sort of like this sort of uh, uh, range of fights across the country just these last few months around you, like really sort of targeting utility companies and the fact that many families have to make hard choices during the winter years about whether they'll be, you know, they'll have heat for their families. They're sort of basic necessities that people have to make hard choices every day. And we have to make sure that as as we're creating public policy, as we're like investing these sort of federal dollars and more dollars that we can be investing at the state and local levels that are really about addressing this question of choice. How do we create opportunities for families to not have to make hard choices every day uh, around basic necessities for themselves um, and their families? Um, and I would say, you know, this is an opportunity, I think, at the local and state level in particular, because there's so much um, there's, there's sort of like so much that we can do and so many experiments that we can try around different sort of policies that it creates an opportunity to not just address sort of like the immediate challenges, but think about how we define like more affirmative, you know, more sort of proactive visionary ideas and test out different things that are the people that live these issues best at the local level 
can actually have space to imagine and, and fight for um, a lot of these sort of more specific examples. And uh, I'll just sort of close by saying, you know, one of the issues that you'll hear about um, in a little bit is sort of this sort of big fight that we've had around childcare at the federal level that is now we're undertaking also at the local and state. And we're seeing how, for example, ARPA money has created all these opportunities for places like Ohio and Franklin County investing $22 million to be able to actually address a lot of the, the wage disparities for the workforce, the childcare workforce, which by the way, is primarily low income women of color. Um, and actually expanding access and affordability for families. Or New York, my home state, where we're seeing that the governor, uh, despite a not great budget across the board, um, has really sort of uh, thrown down to really support uh, a big investment in childcare, which will address a lot of these sort of disparities uh, that already exist um, uh, in the city, in New York City, and in the state as a whole. And there are many examples like that. And I think they're important because they actually create this question of like president setting, what is possible, and then other states will follow um, because they'll see the success, right, potentially of these, of these uh, investments, and then they'll follow suit. And it helps us make a stronger case that at the federal level, we need to keep bringing more money um, to be able to sustain, not just do one shots, right, but to actually be able to sustain these investments over time. Thank you so much. Um, now I want to introduce my colleague, Ian Pfeiffer, who serves as the Maryland State Director for Six and Six Action, working to support legislators and movement partners in Maryland. Prior to Six, Ian served as a legislative advisor on Capitol Hill and as an advocate in both Washington and Annapolis. In addition, he was twice elected to the Annapolis City Council, where he worked to enact progressive policies in Maryland's capital city. Ian, you just had a big win for family leave in Maryland. Tell us about the win and what other communities can learn about it in terms of seizing the moment for family leave. Thank you, Noel. Um, yeah, absolutely. It's a very um, exciting time here for the advocates and legislators who worked so hard for so many years to, to see paid family leave enacted here. Um, it's, it's become law over the over the veto of the governor, um, and and very, and very soon, basically, that Marylanders will be able to 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 get up to twelve weeks uh, to to care for a loved one or themselves, and up to twenty four weeks for new parents. So it's a very exciting development. We we are, I think, believe the eleventh state in recent years who's enacted this. So there is um, a, a great deal of excitement around that. the the The, the reality is, it's, it was a very hard fought, multi year effort that was challenging to. Uh, to, to everyone involved and very frustrating. I, I think you know the, 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 the pieces of, of sort of setting up this, this kind of program um, and, and you know, you know who, would, who would pay for it and what the contributions would look like and how to set up a fund that would be solvent for, you know, for, for the long haul and, and, and who would be eligible. And you know, all those questions really sort of um, were, were challenging for the legislators to, to, to figure out how to get through to, to this place where we, we finally arrived. And I think a, a key piece of why the, it sort of got got done this year was because there was a real exciting announcement from the Biden administration earlier this year in, in Washington and the Department of Treasury came out with some guidance that said the American Rescue Plan dollars that that states and, and municipalities have been receiving um, could, could be used to to study and create and fund paid family leave programs, um, which, which was sort of a game changer for for what was happening here in Maryland and I think probably in a lot of communities around the country. And, and, and at six, you know, we, we we partnered with a Better Balance, who's a wonderful organization that does a lot of a lot of research and and supporting advocates on the ground and, and paid family leave efforts. We're really, sort of the, the national leader on that, and so, sort of saying this, you know, this information that's coming out of the Department of Treasury needs to needs to needs to get out um, in a much more orchestrated way. And you know, we 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 organized a webinar last month, I believe, that, that basically you know our whole network of legislators and partners to sort of share this information in hopes that it would sort of spur innovation um, in places across the country as people are sort of aware of this opportunity as they're spending those ARP dollars um, could, could, could actually force this conversation. I think it was, it was a really fascinating conversation. We're happy to I think, share, share that webinar link and, and some of the follow-up that people are interested in sort of seeing the, the really in-depth information that a better balance shared about, about, about how this has already started to happen in communities across the country in, in very innovative ways of approaching it, which is a really exciting development coming out of this. 
Thank you. Uh, next, I'll be introducing Stan Santos, who is the District 9 Broadband, Broadband Brigade Lead at the Communications Workers of America, or CWA. Stan has more than 23 years of experience in the industry and was a former vice president of Local 9408 in Fresno and now serves as the CWA Central Valley Legislative Chair. He has also worked on speed matters and garnered city council resolutions in support of fiber optic broadband access in rural communities in California. Stan, what are the big opportunities that you see for making equitable broadband happen for our communities? And what are the demands that you and other CWA workers are fighting for in this implementation process? Thank you, Nahal, and thank you for this opportunity. Uh, historic uh, federal investments in broadband infrastructure, you know, they represent a huge opportunity to connect underserved communities, particularly in Central California, where, I'm, where I live and work, with hundreds of rural communities, thousands of families who sustain themselves and the nation uh, working in the fields. We hope that one day their children will not have to attend classes or do homework while they sit in the parking lot of a Taco Bell or struggle with Wi-Fi hotspots that work only marginally when they work. Uh, in California, uh, the states harnessed uh, American Rescue Plan funds and state surplus to make a $6 billion investment in broadband infrastructure. This will be supplemented by the Infrastructure Act BEAD program with hundreds of millions more for last mile investments. Uh, the sheer size of the investment, if deployed correctly, will result in more than 9,000 miles of fiber optic network infrastructure and provide fiber to thousands of homes, businesses, community institutions. The ultimate goal is to serve almost 2 million unserved households in California and many more homes and individuals who are underserved or who cannot afford the internet. We thank you and the administration for the uh, strong federal guidelines for the uh, American Rescue Plan that encourage standards that provide the efficient deployment of high quality infrastructure and avoid disruptive and costly delays. It supports strong labor protections, project labor and community benefit agreements, prevailing wage rates, local hire and employment opportunities to ensure a reliable supply of skilled labor and minimize labor disputes and workplace injuries. As a technician, I'm intimately familiar with the environment we work in and these standards are very important to us. You know, regarding our demands, you know, CWA is working to ensure that these investments are done right with a strong preference for fiber optic broadband as, as opposed to inferior technologies and requiring the companies to employ a local well-trained workforce that operates safely for the benefit of workers and the public. We salute Governor Newsom and California state agencies but thus far, they're unable to provide precise data regarding the labor capacity required to complete this build. Uh, the, deba the debate in part is how to spend the money quickly to avoid the feds clawing it back. So there's a, you know, also a push for publicly owned networks. We understand that and wireless options. Most communities don't have the capacity to stand up and maintain their own network and will eventually need to partner with existing ISPs although that may be an option for some. Fiber versus other broadband delivery method has the greatest speed capacity is less costly to the consumer in the long run and future proof. We call for strong oversight and accountability for these funds to ensure these networks are built right, but they require a highly trained workforce. The dominant service providers in California have been cutting thousands of technicians jobs and shrinking their service footprint for the most profitable areas to provide for their shareholders. While several thousand CWA members are on the street or working for other employers and industries, the broadband industry claims a shortage of skilled technicians. Instead of good jobs with training, progressive wage scale paths to lasting careers, their response is temporary employees and low road subcontractors. Regarding the labor standards, federal guidelines only encourage, there are no mandates, and state guidelines are being put together piecemeal, relying on regional groups or consortia, boards of supervisors and lobbyists who are exerting extreme pressure on the state legislature and agencies. Meanwhile, the public's in the dark, you know, waiting for change to come to their communities. Again, 
We want state and federal funds to go to high road employers. The standards we see, safety, quality, accountability, local workforce, labor compliance should be boilerplate clauses in the state implementation guidelines. We demand transparency and adherence to these principles. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, I'm gonna to turn to Yua Vosper. Yua is the policy and regulatory manager for We Act for Environmental Justice, working to influence executive, legislative, and regulatory agency actions, and to educate key, key stakeholders on matters that support reforms in toxic contamination, climate education, and federal investments in electrification. She's a graduate of Fordham Law School, holds a Master of Science in Human Ecology, and graduated cum laude from uh, Loyola University. Yua, we know that there's so much more to be done to clean up our communities and to take action on the climate crisis, but there are some key tools for communities to use right now to get access to clean water and to clean up toxic contamination that are available. In addition, there are some funds that could be used to help or hurt the climate based on how they're spent. What are you focused on right now in implementation? And we, you are muted, so we want to make sure that you unmute so we can hear you. Huh. <laughs> um, thank you for having me and thank you for pointing that out. You would think by now I would know <laughs> with all the Zoom calls. Um, but as you said, uh, we'd start with water. There's so much uh, implementation going around with um, the, you know, the clean water state revolving funds and the drinking water state revolving funds. The bipartisan infrastructure has um, set aside 15 billion for lead remediation um, in, you know, it, to remediate lead all, in all over in, um, in, especially in communities of color. The Biden-Harris administration has um, begun their lead uh, pipe and paint action plan. Um, we also have with the Department of Energy, um, some clean energy, um, funding and FEMA for resilience. So what we wanna do is we wanna focus all of these buckets and we wanna think about how we can use all three and work with all three to strengthen our communities and build healthier communities and therefore build more climate resiliency, have healthier homes with less indoor air pollutants, um, and just build an overall healthy community, especially in disadvantaged communities. It's, especially communities of color. Um, and we also wanna think about access. Um, there's a lot of funding, but how do we access this funding? How do we give communities the resources they need to have this funding? And when we think about that, we can think about other government resources such as community banks, um, credit unions, and also um, corporate finance institutions, community finance institutions. And what these will do is provide for um, technical assistance. Um, these uh, financial institutions have a lot of money. So they have the money that can be used to ensure that all organizations have access to this money. And in addition, we can start looking at, you know, banks and other companies such as corporate um, responsibilities. You know, they always want to give money. <laughs> so we can look at how we can, use that money to fund projects in disadvantaged communities. And also the federal government um, has to do its part as we you know, had earlier, we had a very long discussion, do its part in you know, making sure not only there's all these funds, but making it accessible. Um, the, you know, with the, the memo for drinking water, there is technical assistance with funding. Um, so the EPA recommends use of the full drinking water state revolving fund at 2% of the small system technical assistance that is set aside for newly available clean water state revolving funds. It's very technical. So, I mean, there has to be someone to break this down to people so they can be able to understand. Um, and when we think about, you know, funds and access, we look at um, our work, one of our worker cooperatives, which is SUNS. And, you know, having access to these loans and these tax rebates and, you know, we think about having, you know, groups like this worker cooperative, having opportunities to bid on their own and having enough capital um, with loans and with, you know, rebates and credits to think about, you know, how can we make sure infrastructure money 
is being adequately dispersed throughout all communities and not just, you know, available to some. Um, and, you know, making sure everyone has access to everything in the community so that we can just build a healthy community all around. Thank you. Now I want to bring in Whitney Pasek and Letty Maderos into the conversation. Whitney is the Director of Federal Child Care Policy at the National Women's Law Center and served in AmeriCorps and has experience as an early Head Start teacher. And Letty is currently serving as the Senior Managing Director at Clark Hill, a law firm where she focuses on helping nonprofits advance paid leave, investments in child care, as well as investments in cancer research. So much. She's a veteran of Capitol Hill with more than two decades in public service and has dedicated her career to the working families agenda, working on gender equity issues and labor law. Whitney and Letty, as any parent knows, child care is an essential part of our economy and it's been in crisis in the last few years. What's on the table right now for child care? Thank you so much for having me. And I appreciate Wendell Lee setting us up so perfectly to talk about child care. So the American Rescue Plan and the 2020 COVID relief packages included critical investments of more than $50 billion in child care relief. These relief funds helped stabilize an otherwise collapsing child care sector, supported parents and other caregivers' ability to work and care for their children, supported children's healthy development, and raised wages for the essential workers who care for and educate children every day. And while the American Rescue Plan provided robust relief, it was not designed to address the long-term structural flaws in our economy that made the pandemic so devastating for women of color and their families and harmed communities across the nation. Even before COVID-19, America faced a childcare crisis. The pandemic the pandemic has laid bare and exacerbated the deep inequities of a childcare system that relies on families paying unaffordable sums, early educators being paid poverty level wages, and too many communities across the country lacking sufficient workforce or facilities to meet childcare demands. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen recently summed up the dynamic well. She said childcare is a textbook example of a broken market and unworkable. Letty? And I just want to touch base very quickly on the rescue plan uh, for the folks listening to the conversation, um, you know, which in infused almost $50 billion to provide relief to families in the child care sector. Um, the interesting part about this, all states have taken this money, and since it was embedded in the existing child care development block grant. Um, so the uh, ARPA funds mitigated much of the originally projected consequences of the catastrophe that we were facing during the first uh, year of the pandemic. And it has worked to stabilize the field. According to a recent review by the Century Foundation, uh, building on earlier uh, COVID relief funds, the ARPA funds have prevented nearly 75,000 permanent childcare closures, saving more than 3 million spots for young children who need care and education. Um, without it, the, uh, the sector probably would have collapsed. Um, and uh, it's an example for, for everyone out there listening that when elected officials do their job um, and address the care needs um, of the public, progress is needed. And I think that's where folks can come in. They can check in with state and local governments as to the status of these funds, how they've been committed, what's their timeline. The funds goes, go out until 2024. Um, we have um, Child Care Aware has a tracker, has been uh, looking at how these funds are going out. Um, and, and it's really important to hold the feet to the fire of local officials um, to get this money out. You know, local governments have very uh, sometimes convoluted procurement processes, um, to be kind. Um, and it, they really need the outside pressure um, to, uh, to get this money out that is desperately needed. And it has worked but it could work even better. The other process that I wanted to mention that it's sort of like um, DC's best kept secret is the, um, the annual appropriations process. Currently childcare funding comes through the childcare development block grant and it is discretionary, meaning it is not mandatory funding. It can change from year to year. Um, and this is something that happens every year on the, unless the government shuts down. And we always hear about government shutdowns, but we hardly ever hear about the millions and billions of dollars that go out to local governments. 
um, in, in, in services and in benefits for families. So, you know, as I've worked in appropriations for more than 20 years and how I wish that, you know, organizers and activists were more engaged in the process um, because for example, in the childcare development block grants, there's more than $6 billion that go out to states um, to, to make sure that, that low-income families have, have these funding to, to help them. So um, I'll send, send it back right back to Whitney. I know we're running short on time, but I just do want to mention super quickly that childcare still is in the mix for the reconciliation economic package and that that is really needed funding um, to make sure that families can afford childcare and, and workers are paid fair wages. I'll pass it back to you, Nahal. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now, but not least, I do want to bring in Connor Hurley from the National Education Association, or NEA. Connor is a senior policy analyst, analyst and a program specialist with the NEA. As a campaign professional, he has managed campaigns for the U.S. Senate, governor, U.S. House, mayor, and issue advocacy organizations. He's a diehard Boston sports fan um, and worked across the East Coast um, from South Carolina, which he served as the executive director of the South Carolina Democratic Party to Connecticut. An expert in organizing, he presently leads the NEA School Rescue Fund Coordinators Network in DC. Connor, our schools are part of our infrastructure and the fabric of our communities. What is at stake for schools right now and what is possible to win? Absolutely. Thank you, Nahal, and thank you for having me here. I'm happy to be with this group. It's great to get to talk to so many friendly faces. Um, in the ARP funds, we saw over $170 billion ad allocated just to education, with 90% of it going to local education agencies. So what this means is there is historic funding across the country for education. And as we've been talking about infrastructure, education and schools are a critical component from the buses that deliver our students to schools to the buildings themselves. And one of the things we saw recently was 55% of educators plan to leave the profession early. And the number one thing they said was ventilation and school safety. So making dramatic improvements to ventilation, to health and safety in our schools, to green transportation is going to be a critical component. And what we're seeing across the board is this is the first instance in which local education entities cannot say they just don't have the funds. We've seen wins from Battle Creek, Michigan, which is spending $20 million to upgrade their HVAC systems to make schools safer, to Montana, where they're building additional housing to house teachers in rural areas. We, this is a moment where we can capitalize on these historic resources. And it's also a moment where we can move as a community, as a progressive community forward and show that when you fund public infrastructure, when you fund schools, we make massive gains across the board. In Michigan, they did a study that showed um, for summer school, the every degree, the temperature goes up one, per, one degree, you lose 1% of learning. And so this is that moment to seize on these funds, to make sure our students, to make sure our educators are funded and they have the resources they need. And there's a lot at the, on the line here and we're making massive gains. So thank you. Thank you. Um, now we're running a little short on time. So I wanna do a quick round robin of anybody of our, any of our panelists that want to jump in. Now, each of you is on the front lines of an issue with live opportunity to secure billions of dollars to fund local communities right now. What do you need people to do right now to ensure that this funding does the most good for our communities? I'll open it up to our panelists who wanna jump in. We'll take Whitney. Thanks for the question. Um, Seti, um, Letty set us up nicely as well to talk about that, you know, we really need people to um, talk with local providers and parents and to find out whether this money has reached them and what gaps still persist because we know that while the funding helped it wasn't enough and so in our follow-up materials um, we'll, we'll share some resources where people can get in touch with their um, state administrators as well as just look at how the money has been spent in your state as well as having those conversations and as I kind of alluded to earlier um, to use whatever information you find to make the case to your senators about why childcare sustained funding 
funding needs to be in the reconciliation package so that it's not just relief we're talking about, but building the system that parents and, um, and children and providers really need, as well as if people want to plug in more, I'm going to share my email address and you can sign up for the Law Center's weekly federal memo where we share the latest updates on what's happening with child care and how um, you can get engaged. Thanks. Wonderful. I'm going to call on Connor and Wendell next. Thank you. Um, I think one of the most important things is just knowing that the funds are there and that they're everywhere. And we need people to advocate for them at the local level. So many of these funds are with districts that are very, very local to you, that you know the school board members and the city council members in your communities. But not everybody knows about these funds availability. And what we need is that sort of ground level community activism that's going to change the country for the better. And it's just so difficult from the national perspective because we're not dealing with 50 states. We're dealing with, for us, it's 1,400 education local associations. And that's a very big challenge and why we need so much help and support to take full advantage of these opportunities. Thank you. Uh, I'll just uh, ditto, ditto everything that's been said. I think the most important thing is to continue to be really vigilant, to pay attention to what's happening and how different municipalities and states are actually using these dollars to make sure it goes to the people that need them the most. And a uh, shout out May 9th, we actually have a national day of action, a day without child care supportive providers. Um, so I'm going to put in the chat a link to a uh, day without child care website and folks can look at all the different events and sign up to participate if you're in any of the locations. I think we have you on next and then Stan. Yes, um, as I, whatever Connor said, what Connor said was just perfect, um, kind of what I was going to say as well. You know, we need to make sure that everyone has access and everyone knows about them. I think the big part of being able to access funding is to know where they are and to know how to utilize them and also um, take advantage of any kind of technical assistance that is being offered to make sure that when you're filling out these applications and going for these funding that's necessary for your community that you have someone who can walk you through the process so that you don't you know skip a, a very minuscule step and then you know maybe have to go back to the drawing board or you know fill out another application but I also think even though we do have to, you know, as grassroots and community-based groups, we do have to be vigilant. There is also, you know, accessibility again has to be given to us. We have to know where they are to be even to ask to assess them. So, you know, um, I think that's key and that's it's super important. And thank you. I'll go to Stan. <laughs> thank you. Uh, you. You know, we in relation to the broadband. Uh, we were able to get uh, several city councils, very small communities, you know, like four to 11,000 population to uh, sign resolutions of support for uh, broadband, um, you know, infrastructure for those communities. They were off the map as far as any state planning. And the state listened and they, they agreed and added uh, like 59 miles of fiber network to a plan which otherwise would, would then that whole section would not have happened. So there's a lot of opportunities for grassroots organizing, small community organizing. And uh, so whether it's healthcare, education, childcare, you know, we can use, learn from that and use these same approaches. And, uh, but we have to um, almost because otherwise we're gonna have these boards of supervisors in conservative areas making decisions for us. And then the state agencies in somewhat under the influence of lobbyists are gonna you know, kind of follow their noses. So uh, really the advocacy and grassroots organizing is such an essential part of it. But uh, thank you again. Wonderful. I want to build on that because I want to know what are the key threats that you all are seeing out there to implementing these strong, equitable and effective programs on these issues. And again, we'll take a range of our panelists to chime in. I can, I can go there. Um, I think you know the overpolitization of anything to do with children these days is the threat, and um, and the more we remind folks at the local level, at state level, that these are not uh, services and benefits to the constituency, and harp on that. I think the the better off we are holding back those those threats. Um, 
Letty, we're losing you a little uh, bit. So I want to make sure that we I hear you. If you don't mind to repeat a little bit, we want to make sure that we caught what you said. We're saying there. I was just saying that, you know, to dip a little when it comes to children, it's a service as to families. All right. Thank you. And we'll take it to Connor. Thank you. Absolutely. And uh, just to expand on that, I mean, the politicization of teachers, of children is profound. I think one of the threats here is just um, also inaction and a lack of actually spending the money. Um, we've seen school districts, city councils um, enhance general fund balances to try to use this to save for a rainy day fund as opposed to its purpose, which is to recover from one of the, the great pandemics in our country's history. And so making sure that this is used proactively, that it's used responsibly, and that it actually gets spent is going to be one of the critical things to showing the success of funding our local communities. Great. So as our audience populates some of their questions, one of the questions that we did receive, I want to um, have Wendelay answer. How do you propose to deal with the utility rate hikes? Great question. I think this is a perfect example of like where the like um, the really sort of hyper focus approach is really important. Um, and I mean, I can tell you what some of our partners are doing across the country, which is they are trying to figure out how to actually target some of the utility companies and doing a ton of research around who fund who they fund, <laughs> tying it to folks that are getting in the way of a lot of the implementation on the, on the local work. Uh, and trying to figure out how to organize local folks to be able to actually like build uh, what we call corporate accountability strategies to actually go after what we would say many greedy, um, many, many greedy ones. And, you know, in, in Maine, one of the things that folks uh, are doing, for example, is they're doing a deep canvas of rural communities that are really highly impacted by really high utility bills, uh, particularly heat um, and electricity. And they're trying to figure out how to tie it to uh, the, a lot of the local races right now and where those utility companies tend to give uh, you know, donations because um, they actually are a really big contributor to political donations in a lot of local races, uh, state and, and more local than that. Um, and actually in Michigan, we have a coalition of black uh, led organizations that are doing a uh, black voter protection uh, fight. Um, there's a big fight. I don't know if folks are tracking it in Michigan um, against uh, I, that is essentially trying to institutionalize voter suppression to black communities in the state. And so there's a big sort of fight against that that includes actually targeting a lot of the utility companies, not just heat, but also water and others that are at the core. Uh, they're like at the center of actually supporting a lot of the candidates that are that are the well, the state uh, legislators that are actually behind this really, really terrible uh, bill. Um, so I think that there are lots of things that folks can do, but I think it starts with actually like finding the connections that these utility companies have to actual sitting elected officials and candidates and how they're actually contributing to a lot of the very detrimental policies on the implementation side. Thank you. And the next question that's come in is for you. Um, we, the audience member asked, how do we defend against some of the highway funds and other parts of the Implementation Act that can make climate crisis worse? Thank you. Um, Going back, you know, to some of our biggest fights, when we think about it, it's false solutions and, you know, lobbying for funding. And then all of a sudden, you know, when the bills are being negotiated and passed, funding is slowly starting to decrease. And you realize that your ask is not even half as much as you needed and would actually do little to nothing for the community. So when fighting for or defending against some of the highway funds, at WE ACT, we work with the community. We do not speak for them, we speak with them. We help to empower them. So we go into the community who, you know, we look at groups who are on the ground and we, you know, we work with them um, in a situation uh, where highway, where a, a proposed highway or project was put in a community. 
you know, I sat with the, the group um, president or executive director and we attended meetings together. We, you know, ensured that this is, what is this? You know, what, where is it going? Who is it gonna, you know, we asked the tough questions and we demanded the answers. Um, and we gave examples of how this didn't work before. Um, when building a campaign around it, uh, you would start to you know pull in colleagues and coalitions who are like-minded. A collective voice is very powerful and continue to push. Um, make sure your voice is prioritized. Make sure your voices are heard. Call your state legislators, submit those comments. We um, at WE Act will submit comments um, to say the DOE. And we will also um, have, you know, give testimony. Um, and we also, with our testimony, include community voices as well. So it's not just, you know, we're speaking and just giving and explaining it away. We ensure that people are involved in policy because policy affects people. So um, that's how, you know, we, I would suggest, you know, defending against any kind of highway funds. Thank you. Our next question is coming in for Stan, um, asking about, will there be accountability with the money that has been spent in, showing that companies are actually putting it where they're supposed to and not just getting the money and putting it elsewhere? Yeah, yeah, I appreciate that question. And the other question, there's a little bit of overlap about, will the White House work to uh, you know, make sure that those projects don't replicate historic inequities? And the only way that we can do that is through transparency. and and you shouldn't have to go into a website for the PUC to try to find a report for um, $35 million that was spent on an infrastructure project that may have stopped right across the street from your house. Um, all those should be really um, aired through social media and through any opportunities, any venues that we have. It'll be up to us to probably get the ball rolling, but we need to call press conferences. We need to put out announcements and say, hey, wait a minute, challenge them on this. Challenge us on it. You know, are, is is my union, is CWA, doing everything it can to represent the interests of the consumers and to inter, you know protect our workers? So, yeah, um, there's got to be accountability, and I'm I'm sure that as time goes on, because this is this is a new era. You know, we haven't done this <laughs> lately, and so we're going to learn as we go how to uh, keep everybody honest. But thanks for the question. Wonderful. I think that's actually a perfect transition to the next question that came in which is about the, as we're learning, what are the best practices around implementation bites? Um, how do we build campaigns around these super technical drawn out fights and make sure that the last mile is done right? I'd love to open that up for all of our panelists and whoever wants to jump in. I, I'll jump in. Um, I, I, I'm sorry, I thought one of my first questions was molded with the, the next at the question, but um, going back to what I said, you know, when you think about building campaigns, um, you, I think about building collective power. So ensuring that, you know, you're, you're gathering the people who are like-minded, um, you're gathering the resources that you need. Do you need someone who can provide that technical assistance? And when you have a collective voice, and you have every bit in place, you're able to you know, push to the last mile and everybody's skills and expertise in that coalition can be used to you know, make that implementation fight effective and strong for you and your community. Thanks, I, I'm happy to go next. Um, so I think, I mean, one of the things we've done at the National Education Association, we made a historic investment in on the ground organizing and hired, um, we provided a grant to our affiliates, and we now have a team of 38 um, organizers um, in 38 states around the country um, working solely on ARP funding. But one of the things that we've learned and seen um, in all of these funds, there is a need for meaningful consultation. It's required by law, which requires them to go to all stakeholders, whether that's labor, whether that's parents, whether that's educators, whatever it is, they have to include everyone before they expend these funds. Not every state is doing that in a collective way. What we saw work in San Antonio, Texas, where they were being denied their meaningful consultation was they ran an organizing campaign. They hustled through text message um, members, parents, they knocked on doors, they ran campaigns that raised awareness. And now of the funds that are going to the school district, 25% of those funds have to go through a stakeholder committee that is comprised of parents, educators, union members, union leadership, and students. And so one of the things we have 
been promoting is these campaigns to force the local issues into the front and center with parents, with our community members, with our allies, and make sure that that gets done. I did all, and I'll just add like that is actually, in my opinion, the most important thing that we can do is actually supporting local organizing power building infrastructure that allows for folks to be able to come in and out of campaigns instead of the other way around. Like campaigns are a vehicle to advance power and community power. And like if we approach the way that we sort of do our work from that angle rather than campaigns are the end uh, rather than the means to the end, uh, I think that's, that's really what it is about investing in local organizers, talent, the leadership of uh, indigenous you know, uh, folks in, in those communities. Uh, and uh, I would say to sort of find a way to build this sort of really local sort of ecosystem that's about building complementary infrastructure that includes our ability to be able to, in a year like now, in 2022, to be able to leverage elections, to be able to actually push our issues to the forefront and our communities' needs to the forefront. You know, we, we won all those um, equity and justice issues in the 60s and 70s through massive mobilizations. And we can learn from that and go back to our roots and go back to that history. And uh, we've got to mobilize again. It, there's no reason that an infrastructure bill sits in Congress, you know, when they're playing with people's lives and they're getting their directives from lobbyists or whatever the case is. And, you know, I think the people, you know, we can mobilize enough folks, we can overcome all of that. Thank you all for participating in our crucial panel today to talk about the opportunities that are available for the first time or on an expanded basis for our communities, the ways that a, a variety of issues that touch our lives can be augmented, mitigated, harm reduced, if you will, by a number of these policies and resources that are available to our communities and the real ways that we are all joining together in unique um, ways to realize these opportunities, to ensure that they're in the hands of our communities and to better the conditions of our lives. I'll hand things over to Jessica. Thank you to all of our panelists. I just wanna second Nahal and thanking all of you um, for sharing all these, I was taking furious notes <laughs> this whole time. Um, and thank you for sharing all of your expertise with us. Thank you, Nahal, for moderating. And thank you to everyone who has uh, joined us for this call and for all the work that you're doing and leading in your community. Um, you will receive an email um, sometime next week with a link to the recording for this call and a Google fo folder full of resources with all of the links that were dropped in the chat, plus a whole bunch more. Um, so really encourage you to look out for that email. If you joined, um, I, you clicked the join now link and that means that your name is event participant or something along those lines. Um, really encourage you to actually fill out the form so we have your email and you can get that recording and get those resources. They are really fantastic um, and really, really useful stuff that you can go and hit the ground running. So please make sure you sign up um, on the, um, the link that uh, we just dropped in the chat so that we actually have your email and you can actually get these great resources. You don't wanna miss it, I promise. Um, we won't spam you. <laughs> it's, just, it's just good resources. Um, and so I also wanna remind you that our next training will be on May 19th, three weeks from today at same time, um, where we're gonna talk about organizing around must pass bills and how we um, engage with these type of bills, the type of trade-offs, um, the type of strategies that we want to engage in talking about some of those must pass bills that are um, that are uh, coming up. And I, I will <laughs> hearken back to what Letty said, that the appropriations process is gonna come up on that one. So if you're interested in learning about appropriations and the ways that we can leverage it for our communities, I encourage you to sign up for that May 19th session. Um, thank you so, so much to all of our panelists and to all of you for joining us. We really appreciate um, you and all of your work. Thanks everyone, have a great day.